We are in week four of a series that I've called Life is Hard, God Helps. Those are two profound truths that are very connected. How many of you know life is hard? How many of you know that potentially you have more hard days ahead of you? How many of you know that God helps? Right? We need to tie those two things together because in the middle of our hardest days, sometimes we forget God's our helper. Sometimes we forget God even cares. Sometimes we forget that God is close. Sometimes we forget God's a resource. Sometimes we think we're in it all by ourselves. It's so hard. And so we've been talking about that, and we'll conclude it next week on Easter. The last message in this five-part series is Easter Sunday, and my message next Sunday is don't quit. And somebody needs to hear that message. Like you, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it anymore. I don't know if I have it in me to keep going. I don't know. It could be your dream and you've about to, you're about to give up on it. It could be your marriage and you're about to give up on it. It could be a, a prodigal kid who's gone off the rails and you're about to give up on it. Whatever it is, like you're fighting for sobriety, you're about to give up on it. Come back next week. Don't quit is the message and uh, it comes right from the Easter story. So we're going to talk about that. Today we're going to talk about kind of an after-the-fact thing that so many of us have experienced, and that is when life flies apart. And what you see is just the rubble and the pieces of your life. Like it's already broken. It's already fallen apart. Is it possible to have a fresh start? Is it possible to take the broken parts of your life and see them come back together in some kind of meaningful, purposeful way so that your life can once again become all that God created your life to be. Is that even possible? See, we're taught from childhood that it's not possible. You remember that profound theological treatise, Humpty Dumpty. (laughs) See, once that dude falls, all the king's horses and all the king's men could not what? Put Humpty Dumpty together Again, and so we've grown up believing once it breaks, it's always broken. My question, is that true? This is relevant. We need to know because everybody here is going to have life break apart. Everybody here is going to experience setbacks. Life is not a string of unbroken victories. We all fail. We all have defeats. We all have losses. Nobody is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Life is hard. And sometimes that hardness crushes us. And when our life implodes or explodes, what do we do? What do we do? There's a a guy, and even if you didn't grow up in church, you've heard his name because it's a A phrase we'll use just in culture, the patience of Job. Job is a story about a man whose life collapsed. Family died. Finances failed. Everything he once knew. It it was all broken. And Job wrote about this. Here's what he said. My days have passed. You know what that means? My best days are behind me. You ever felt that way? Like maybe you're a great athlete young, and then it's like, dude, now I got an injury. I can't do it. And it's like my best days are behind me. Or you had... Great success in business, then bankruptcy. And it's like, I, my best days are behind me. That was Job's feeling. Like, like, no matter how good it once was, it'll never be that good again. That's what he believes. Look at this. My plans are shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. My plans are broken, and my heart's broken, and my best days are behind me. And what do you do then? Some of you are sitting here thinking, Brad, You know, I know that's important to somebody, but dude, it's not important to me. I mean, my life's going pretty good. Like, I kind of got it going on. I just want to say one thing to you. Take notes, (laughs) write this stuff down, and don't lose your paper. (laughs) Because life either has been hard, or it's hard right now, or for the smart alecks in the room, guess what? It's going to be hard. So hang on to that paper, because if you don't need it today, I'm telling you, you are going to need it. You are going to need it. Can I get an amen? Amen. You're going to need it. We're not hoping for it. I'm just telling you it's coming your way. It's coming your way. So here's what we're going to do. There was a dad. His name was Solomon, and he, he cared about his sons. And so he wrote down advice for his sons. He was known as a very wise person. He had great wisdom, and so he just wrote these these 
truths about how to live life that were very wise and very insightful and one right after another and he collected them and we now have them in the Hebrew ancient scriptures and and it's a collection of these sayings called Proverbs there's 31 chapters of just one right after another and written from a father's heart to help his kids be successful in life and we're going to look at some of the Proverbs today because in the Proverbs what we're going to find, first of all, are five reasons we fail. Like to understand how do we get to those broken places, then we're going to spend the last part of our time, how do we have a fresh start once life has broken. So if you are taking notes, let's jump in. Five causes of failure and Solomon taught these to his kids. Here we go. Number one, we fail when we don't plan ahead. <coughs> we fail when we don't plan ahead. It's like the old saying, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Here's what Solomon wrote to his son. A sensible man. Would you circle that? Some of you are saying, that's an oxymoron. A sensible man <laughs> watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. But the simple-minded, circle that. Do you see the comparison and contrast? We have a sensible man. He lives life one way. Then we have a simple-minded man. He lives life another way. The sensible man is looking ahead. He's preparing ahead. He's planning in advance. The simple-minded man, look at that. He never looks. Suffers the consequences. Simple-minded man's impulsive. He always leaps before he looks. But the smart guy always looks before he leaps. Are you simple-minded or are you sensible? Some in the room have a tendency to be impulsive, and you would admit you've paid a pretty high price for that. Others of you are planners, and you would be able to say it has helped you way more in life than you could have imagined. The impulsive person never looks ahead. The sensible person always looks ahead. Solomon said this to his son, we ought to make our plans, planning, counting on God to direct us. Now, why is that important? Because God's a planning God. God's a sensible God. God's always looking ahead. And if we follow God's ways, he's going to help us be prepared ahead. Think about this. If Noah had waited to the last minute, was unprepared for the rain and the flood to come, he would have drowned. He would have never had time to build the boat and get it ready and get his family and get the animals and get all that ready. He'd have never had time. The rain would have come, the floods would have risen, he would have died, but because he planned ahead, he followed God's direction and God's a sensible God and God's a planning God, Noah was ready when the flood came. Do you know how long ahead of time Noah knew the flood was coming and he could get the boat ready? You know how many years he was building that boat? 120 120 years. Listen, as far as we know, there'd never been a flood. So when his friends say, no, what you doing? I'm building a boat. Well, first of all, they said, what's a boat? <laughs> well, it's what you need when there's a flood. Well, what's a flood? Well, that's what happens when it rains too hard. What's rain? As far as we know, it had never rained. And Noah's doing this 120 years, taking the skepticism, taking the ridicule, taking the popes, you know, but he's planning ahead. So by the time the flood came, because he'd followed God's direction, God had Noah prepared. God's a sensible God, God's a planning God, and we do it his way, we're going to be prepared. We fail when we fail to plan. Number two, we fail when we think we're bulletproof. Let me give you a synonym. Arrogance. When we think we have it all together, when we think there's no way I can fail, Oh, yeah, other people have tried and failed, but not me. That's when we're in trouble. Here's what Solomon said to his son. Pride leads to destruction and arrogance to a downfall. Can I get a witness? I'm not talking about you. It's never happened to you. But how many of you know somebody it's happened to? Yeah, we do. Somebody said the person who gets too big for his britches will be exposed in the end. <laughs> That's a visual joke. It'll take you a minute uh, to get that. When we think we're bulletproof, watch out. Pride will cause us to fail. The average American always thinks he's above average. One of the symptoms of pride is we don't think we need advice. I've got the answers. I know how to do this. I know, I know. You, you've got your own ideas, but let me just do it my way. Hmm. Here's what Solomon told his sons. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed 
Always remember the lesson of the whale. Just about the time you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when you get harpooned. Don't ever forget that. Right when you're about to blow, look at me. Woo! I don't know what sound they make. That's when the harpoons come. All right? Too big for your britches. Number three, we fail when we're afraid to take risks. This is huge. We fail when we're afraid to take risks. If you're a people pleaser, let me give you a verse you should memorize. Here's something you should just memorize. Memorize this one. Fear of man is a dangerous trap. Fear of man is a dangerous trap. Say it with me. Fear of man is a dangerous trap. When I am afraid of their opinion, when I am afraid of their rejection, when I am afraid of their disapproval, when I am afraid of what people are going to think of me, if I'm afraid that they're going to exclude me, I start bending what God might want me to do to accommodate them rather than to live the life God wants me to live. Does that make sense to you? People pleasing. We've all done it. Most of us have done it. People pleasers. If we trust God, like I only live for an audience of one. If God is happy with me, this isn't to be mean, but then I shouldn't care what anybody else thinks of me. Does that make sense? God's happy. Pleasing God, I don't have to worry if I'm pleasing anybody else. The moment you start to worry about what other people think, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's the fear of failure that can become the cause of your failure. Like God wants me to go this way, but I'm so afraid what they might think if I go God's way. I've already failed because I'm now compromising on what God wanted me to do. I'm going this way. It's the fear of failure that might be the cause of failure. When we get afraid to take risk, we're going to miss a lot of abundance in life. If we're afraid to go out on a limb, we're never going to get the fruit that is out at the end of a limb. We have to be willing to take some risk. When we're afraid to take some step forward, then all of a sudden we're beginning to fail. Number four, we fail because we give up too soon. This is huge. We fail because we give up too soon. <coughs> See, the problem with trying times is that people just stop trying. How many basketball games have been won with last-second shots? Like, what if they just stopped shooting? Well, every time I shoot, then they get ahead. And every time I shoot, they score again. I might as well just quit. No, you just keep shooting. Ask Kobe Bryant. You just keep shooting, whether you're making the baskets or not. No Lakers fans here? I was kind of hoping to offend somebody with that, but I guess I didn't. We give up too soon. Here's what Solomon said to his sons. A lazy fellow has trouble all through his life. Listen to me. Lazy is not an unwillingness to try. Lazy people will try. Lazy people won't try again. Like when they try, they want it to work and they don't want it to be hard. But if it's hard and it doesn't work the first time, then they don't try again. And they have trouble all through their life, Solomon told his kids. What's the old saying? If at first you don't succeed, you're normal. Life's not going to work easily. Life's not going to work the first time every time. So we have to be able to try again. Many times success is right around the corner. You never fail until you quit. Thomas Edison tried over 200 times to get that uh, incandescent light bulb. He said that wasn't a failure, it was a lesson. I now know the ways that don't work, and I found the one way that does work. Do you know how many times Abraham Lincoln lost elections before he was elected president of the United States? Most of them. Almost every election he ever was a part of, he lost. And so he thought, I might as well run for president, and he won. Remember, lazy people don't fail to try they just want it easy, and they want it to work first time. And if it doesn't, laziness means they don't try again. I love the image of a post stamp. It has the ability to stick to one thing until it gets there, and that's what we need to adopt. We fail because we don't plan ahead. We think we're bulletproof. We're afraid to take risk. We give up too soon, and this fifth one is big. We fail because we don't listen to God. We fail because we don't listen to God. God has a plan for your life. God created you to become everything that you could possibly become. To get every ounce out of you that he created you with. God wants you to live this full, abundant life. Large. God wants that for you. 
And the reason we miss it is because sometimes we think, eh, God's way, eh, I've got some ideas about how I want to live my life. And that's where we get in trouble. Here's what Solomon said to his kids. There is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. Death of self-esteem, death of your dream, death of your potential. I mean, death, death, death. God's way filled with guidelines and principles so our life becomes all it's supposed to be. Our way, it's always going to be destructive. See, in our culture, we have learned to live by emotion. Like, how do I feel about something? Yeah, I, I, I know God says, but I just don't feel right about it. That's my feeling. I'm just not safe. I, I, I don't know. Your feelings lie to you. Your emotions are liars. You might just have gas. You don't know what's going on. You had a bad night's sleep. You don't know what's going on. If we go by emotion, we're going to be misled most of the time. Most of the time. If God says do this, it's likely going to be opposite of what you feel about it. You want to know God's will for your life? Think about what you think is right and then do the opposite. <laughs> You're probably going to find God's will because God's ways are different than our ways. I'll give you a couple of examples. Your feelings are going to say, I need to get and get. I mean, the way I get ahead, I just pile it up. And God says, no, 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 no. The way you get ahead is to give. Well, that didn't feel right. <laughs> That's not natural. See, culturally, the way I become great, I need to be honored, pay attention, applaud. Jesus said, no, 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 no. The way you become great is to humble yourself and be of service to others. See, God's way is so different than our natural inclinations. God says, your ways are not my ways. God says, my ways are higher, better than your ways. When we don't listen to God, when we just go with our gut, I, people say, oh, you know what, my intuition, listen to me. Intuition's fine. I believe in intuition. It's not infallible. What does God want me to do? These are just five of the ways we can fail. There are a bunch more. How many of you are having a deja vu moment? Like, like you know somebody that one of these applies to? Three of you. <laughs> what do you do when you fail? How do you respond? God is more interested in your future than he is in your past. He wants us to have a fresh start when we fail. Here's how you start over. Number one, gosh, if there's one thing I think our culture 2019, if we could get this one, accept responsibility for your failure. Take personal responsibility for your actions. Here's how Solomon said it to his kids. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses, owns it, and forsakes them, changes, he gets another chance. But for some reason it's hard to say, that's on me. I blew it. I'm so sorry. It's hard to say, it was completely my fault, no excuses. It's hard to say. I was wrong 100%. Most of us are experts in passing the buck. It's natural to pass the buck. It goes all the way back to the first people. You remember Adam and Eve? God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit of this particular tree. Eve goes over, takes a big bite. She walks over, gives it to Adam, says, you're going to like this. Adam takes a big bite. God comes in and says, wait, 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 what did you do? Adam said, you know what, this woman you gave me? And we've been blaming women ever since. Or we blame the economy. Or we blame the weather. Or we blame God. Or we blame the government. We blame our parents. God says, if you want to start over, and you have failed in some area of your life, own it. Own it. You're not perfect. Can I get an amen? So why do we pretend we are? 
The way we pretend we're perfect is by never admitting a mistake. It's like if I admit a mistake, then people are going to know I'm not perfect. Guess what we already know? You're not perfect. It's not going to shock anyone. We think if I come up to you and I tell you, guess what I did, that people are going to go, oh! you know what they're going to do? I know. Me too. Because we're not perfect. It's the inability to admit we're not perfect that keeps us from owning our stuff. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, did you know the person on the other side of you is not perfect? Go ahead and let it, just let them know. They might not know. They might not know. <clears throat> All right. Accept responsibility for your own stuff. Number two, stop regretting and start repenting. Stop regretting and start repenting. We think repenting is a negative church word. Listen, repenting is one of the most positive words you can ever add to your vocabulary. Repenting means always turning toward the good, always turning toward the healthy, always turning toward the better. What repenting means is when I realize I'm going the wrong way, I turn and go a better way. When I realize I'm not the person I want to be, I make the changes to become the person I want to be. That's repenting. It's always positive. It's never negative. When God asks people to repent, he's always saying, make a positive change in your life. Go in a better direction. What you're doing now hurts you. What you do now hurts other people. I want to help you, and I want to help the people around you, so turn in a better direction. Stop regretting. Regretting keeps you stuck. When you just sit there and say, oh, I'm a loser, I'm worthless, I blew it, you're stuck. When you say, I blew it, what can I learn from it? What changes do I need to make to get out of it? Now life starts to become beautiful. There's two kinds of sorrow. The sorrow that'll keep you stuck, the sorrow that'll make you better. The sorrow that makes you better is God's sorrow. The sorrow that'll make you stuck is worldly sorrow. Pity party. Here's how it's written. The sadness that is used by God brings a change of heart. And look at this. This leads to salvation. It's always positive. There's no regret in that. Worldly sadness causes death. Two kinds of sadness. God's sadness, worldly sadness. Godly sorrow motivates you to change. Worldly sorrow is demoralizing. It's depressing. It's that, oh, poor me. You're just at that pity party. God's sorrow always leads to positive. Worldly sorrow keeps you stuck in your past. Here's the positive way. Here's what repentance means. <clears throat> I learned. I changed. I moved forward. I learned change I move forward I learn I change I move forward say it with me I learn I change I move forward some things can only be learned through failure but if all you do is regret you haven't learned anything you haven't changed anything like you're you're stuck and you're not becoming who God wants you to be so slam the door on self-pity and let God change you for the good number three forget the past focus on the future forget the past focus on the future there was a follower of jesus his name was paul and he wrote about this he said forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead i press on toward the goal to win the prize for which god's called me heavenward in christ jesus forget what's behind focus on what's ahead let me say it this way don't let your defeats defeat you you don't have to stay in that place see i know for somebody in the room it's the memory of what you did it's the memory of that failure it's the memory of when your world blew apart that still controls you it controls your thinking it controls your behavior it controls your emotions you're stuck in that place it's like trying to drive into your future by only looking at the rearview mirror you're going to crash there's a reason the rearview mirror is small and the windshield is big. It's designed to look ahead. Did you know you were designed to look ahead? That's why your feet point forward. That's why your arms work better in front of you than behind you. 
That's why your eyes are in the front. Your ears are turned toward the front. Your mouth's in the front. Your nose is in the front. There's only one significant body part behind you. I don't even want to talk about that. I'm not even going to talk about that. Your past is your past. You cannot change your past. But you can change you. It is not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. What are you going to do now? Like, people will confess things to me. Brad, I had to tell somebody, and I knew you'd understand. And they'll share some heavy stuff. And mostly what they want me to help them do is unpack like how they got there and how it happened. And here's what I'll say to you if you ever come to me with your stuff. Like that's only marginally important. Like how you got here. What's of utmost importance is where do you want to be? Where do we go from here? We can't undo that. But we can do something to get you toward God's future for your life. There's two guys, and their lives are in stark contrast to each other. (coughs) And they were both followers of Jesus back in the first century. Famous people. One was named Peter, and one was named Judas. I mean, the word Judas still is like, ooh, heavy word. But he and Peter both followed Jesus for about three years. Everywhere he went, everything he taught, every miracle he performed, they were both in. But they both got to a place in their life where they're like, no more. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not in this anymore. I'm not with him anymore. And you know what's interesting? Jesus knew it. He predicted it in both cases. He knew both of them were going to betray him. He said to Peter one time, like the night before he was crucified, he said to Peter, he said, uh, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you know how at the morning light a rooster crows? Before the rooster crows in the morning, You will have three different times told people that you don't even know me. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus got arrested that night. And Peter is by a bonfire very close to where Jesus is being just abused. And some people around the fire say to Peter, wait. Aren't you? Aren't you his follower? Peter said, I don't know him. He even cussed one time. Go read it. Use profane language. I do not know that blankety-blank man. Don't even know him. Third time he said the same thing. And then he heard the rooster crow. Pick up the story. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, and look how this is written, you will disown me. Three times. And Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. Can you imagine what he felt like? Like this isn't going to be fixed. This is irreparable. I've gone too far this time. But Peter stopped regretting. And he started repenting. He didn't focus on his failure, but he turned toward his future. And he became a powerful, devoted follower of Jesus after the resurrection. Judas, for whatever reason, scholars have debated for centuries why Judas did what he did. Because obviously he became very sorry that like Peter, he also betrayed Jesus, but he betrayed Jesus for money. The authorities wanted to arrest Jesus. They didn't know where to find Jesus. And Judas is like, I'll tell you. And they paid him 30 pieces of silver to just tell them where he'd be so that they could arrest him. And he takes the money. They find Jesus exactly where Judas said he would be. Judas walks up to Jesus, kisses him to identify Jesus to the people who are waiting in the bushes. They arrest Jesus. That set in motion the whole thing, the crucifixion. And Judas watches that happen. And obviously he didn't think that would be the result. And he throws the money back at the people who gave him the money. And look what happened. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, like they're going to execute him, he was seized with, and I didn't type in the two words, I'm sorry, so you could add it in, great sorrow. He was seized with great sorrow. And he left, and he went out, and he hung himself. So think of the contrast between the two. 
I've broken God's heart. I've betrayed the very Son of God, Jesus Christ. And Peter says, I want to live a different way. And Judas is like, I can't live another day. We get to choose if we will live with condemnation forever or we confess it and we change and we start moving into the future God wants us to have. One more point, number four. Trust God to work it all out. Trust God to work it all out. I love this paraphrase of Romans 8, 28. We know that to those who love God, who are called according to His plan, everything happens, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. Circle that phrase, pattern for good. How many of you have ever done any kind of needlework or maybe a parent did like cross-stitching or something like that? Anybody here, you, you've ever seen that done? I remember watching somebody do this one time and I'm, I'm like watching and I'm thinking, gosh, I, I wonder if I should tell them, like that's a mess. <laughs> you know, that's, that's ugly. It doesn't make any sense. There's all kinds of knots in the thread and there's no picture. And then I walked behind them and saw it from their point of view and it's the most beautiful picture you ever saw. There's two sides of the fabric. The underside is tangled and knotted. They don't care about that because they know no matter what that looks like over here, the picture's over here. And see, that's what you need to understand about your life and the messes and the knots and the tanglements in, in your life is that from your perspective, it's like that's a mess, but God is on the other side and he's still sewing. He's still cross-stitching. And there's the most beautiful plan and pattern that he wants to work out from the messes of your life. I mean, I used to think a lot, like, how did I get in this place? Or what, what led, was it me? Was it myself? Was it other people that got me into? Was it the devil that got me into? And like I said before, you know, how I got there, the more I live for Jesus, the more I understand, the less important how I got there becomes. And the more important question is, do I believe God has a plan on the other side? Do I believe God is still cross-stitching in my life? Do I believe God is still making something beautiful out of this mess that I'm looking at? It's not just in my life, <coughs> but it's in the life of all the heroes in the Bible. There's a chapter in the Bible. Uh, it's in a, uh, uh, a book called Hebrews. And in the 11th chapter, there's just a list of great people who did great things for God. You know what was true about all of them? They were all losers. <laughs> they all failed. There's adulterers in there. There's murderers in there. There's liars in there. There's some wishy-washy people in there. There's some non-committed people in there. And it's just like, it's just like this litany of these weak-willed, weak-kneed, fallible, imperfect, broken people. And God worked through their life mightily. Let me ask you a question. If God only used perfect people, how much good could he get done in the world? It's not a hard question. If he only, how many perfect people are there? That's not a hard question either. How many perfect people? There's none. So if he only used perfect people, how much good could he get done? None. So God knew from the beginning God knew from the beginning to get his work done in the world. He would do it through people like you and me. He would do it knowing that we'd fail. He would do it knowing we'd betray him. He would do it knowing that we wouldn't always get it right. The good news is he'll still do it. Do you believe God can take the biggest messes of your life and make your life's message? Do you believe that? Somebody asked me this past week. What's your life message? 100% I know it. Because of my messes. My life message is this. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how far from God you've traveled, no matter how long you stayed away from God, anybody can have a fresh start with God through Jesus Christ. Anybody. I'm living proof. You're just not going to go any farther than I did. 
do much worse than I did. Stay away from God as hard and as long as I did. But then I began to see God was still cross-stitching. He had still taken that jumble of thread that I could see, and he'd give me occasional glimpses. Look, Brad, even that I can work into my plan for your life. Even that. There's somebody here who needs to hear for your own heart that God wants to take your greatest failure. He wants to take that thing that you hope just remains a secret, but it's filling you with shame. And God wants to turn that into your greatest strength. He can make a life message out of it, just like he did for me. You look at Moses, his weakness was anger. He lost his temper all the time. He didn't even get to go into the promised land because of his temper. I mean, he hit people, he hit rocks, he killed an Egyptian, and then he became the meekest man on earth. The opposite of what he'd been became his greatest strength. Abraham, Joseph, Paul, all had their weaknesses transformed into a strength. Where does God want to work in your life? If you'll just stop regretting, stop being stuck in that pity party, let God work in your life. Imagine what he could do. Do you believe it? Cue background music. (laughs) Do you believe it? (laughs) Keep it going. It was kind of a mood. It's kind of a little mood there. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Jonah. I think the reason I like the little story of Jonah is because it's one of the shortest stories in the Bible, so I could get it quick, you know. Jonah, oh, look, a bird. I mean, I could hang with Jonah. It's just like four short little chapters. You remember Jonah? God said, this is my plan for your life. And Jonah said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go my own way. And going his own way meant getting on a boat, trying to even go to another country. But the people on the boat threw Jonah into the water, and remember a great fish swallowed Jonah, and while Jonah was in the great fish, he said, God, I'm sorry. And so God had the great fish spit Jonah out on dry land. I think that was God's grace, because there's only two ways out of a fish. I think it was just like, that was mercy, that was mercy. And so, you know, Jonah's like, okay, God, now what do you want me to do? And God, listen, one of the greatest verses is Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. I told you once you didn't do it. But I'll tell you again. It's called a second chance. And then there's the tenth chance. And then there's the hundredth chance. Every time you turn your heart to God, he will begin to work again. You know why? Because God never gets tired of forgiving. He never gets tired, and he always forgives, so he never gets tired of forgiving. God specializes in new beginnings, and it's not too late for you. This is not about turning over a new leaf. This is about starting a brand new life. I'm wondering if you will give your failures to the Lord and let him transform those into your life's message and into your greatest strengths. Let's pray together. Can I make this real personal for some of you right now? I know some of you have had a pretty tough week. And others of you, it's been a tough month. And I know a few of you would say, Brad, my whole life I felt like a failure. My whole life feels like it's just been broken and when I look at my life it is just like the underside of that sewing that cross stitching it's a mess that could be in your marriage it could be in your parenting it could be in your career but what you know this morning is you'd like a fresh start you can begin a new life you can be born again why that metaphor Because a baby is fresh and clean and new. It's not too late. With Jesus Christ in your life, the best is yet to come. So in your heart, 
you would just pray a prayer like this. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it. But will you come into my heart and forgive me? Wipe out those regrets. Help me focus on the future you created me for. I do believe that what I see is a mess, but I do believe you have a pattern and a plan that I'm not seeing. Help me to see it. Take all my dumb choices and fit them into your picture for my life. Help me get past pity and start to rely on your power. Help me focus on my future. I'm going to trust you to work it all out to become my forgiver and to become my leader. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.